Hello, my name is Arya Javidan, and I'm the project manager for the National Consortium of Telehealth Resource Centers. Uh, welcome to the latest presentation in the NCTRC webinar series. Today's session is on telehealth policy in 2023, and it is being hosted by the Center for Connected Health Policy. Uh, these webinars are designed to provide timely information and demonstrations to support and guide the development of your telehealth programs. Just a little bit of background on uh, the consortium. Located throughout the country, there are 12 regional telehealth resource centers and two national, one focused on telehealth policy and the other on telehealth technology assessment. Each serve as focal points for advancing the effective use of telehealth and supporting access to telehealth services in rural and underserved communities. Uh, just a few tips before we get started today. Your audio has been muted. Uh, please use the Q&A function of the Zoom platform to ask questions. Questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. Please note that closed captioning is available and is located at the bottom of your screen. Today's webinar is also being recorded and you will be able to access today's and past webinars on the NCTRC YouTube channel. And with that, I will pass it over to, today, to today's speaker, Mei Kwong, Executive Director for the Center for Connected Health Policy. Thank you, Ari, and thank you everyone for joining us here today. If you give me just one second, I'll go ahead and pull up my PowerPoint here. And just want to make sure, just give a shout out, Aria, if you can't not see my slides very well. But thank you again for the introduction and thank you everyone for joining us today. As Aria mentioned, my name is Mei Kwong. I'm the Executive Director of the Center for Connected Health Policy, or CCHP is the acronym. Today, we're going to be talking about telehealth federal policy in 2023. There's been a lot of recent action um, regarding federal telehealth policy, so we'll be going over that. It may get a little complicated, so I'm going to repeat things and slow things down just to make sure everybody is on the same page, but definitely go ahead and feel free to use the Q&A function if something is not clear to you, which may happen because as I said, it's a little bit complicated on what's going on at the federal level. Before we get started, a bit of disclaimer that I have to make. So know that today's talk is only for informational purposes. It is not to be considered legal advice. CCHP always recommends that you consult with legal counsel if you are interested in a formal legal opinion. And also, if I happen to mention a company or show a picture of some product, know that neither I nor CCHP has any type of relationship, affiliation, or arrangement with such a company. So I know I'm going to focus in on the federal level, but I always like to start off a lot of these presentations with this overview slide here. So this slide is a really, really, really high level overview of the telehealth policy changes, most of them temporary, that were made in response to COVID-19. And it's broken out into what the feds did and what states did. And keep in mind, though, that we are talking, when you're talking about the United States and telehealth policy, that you're really talking uh, at a minimum about 52 different jurisdictions, if you count 50 states, District of Columbia, and the federal government. They all have different approaches to their telehealth policies. Gets even more when you start adding the territories as well. So, but let's just for now focus in on like federal and state. And as you can see, there's some commonalities as far as like the issues that they addressed in their telehealth waivers when they were trying to figure out what to do with COVID-19. And some of these commonalities you see are around like location, the type of provider who could provide services via telehealth, what services were eligible, modality used. And that's mainly because as a lot of established telehealth policy is really based upon these four elements, location, provider type, the type of service, and the modality that's being used. So a lot of the temporary policies in response to COVID-19 touch upon these. But there are other policies that had to be addressed in response to COVID-19 if they want to telehealth to be used as effectively or as widely as possible. And some of these involve like licensure, prescribing, privacy. And you'll see some of these issues you'll find in like the federal level, but you may not necessarily see appearing on the state level. So for example, HIPAA, that's a federal policy. So that's going to be addressed by the federal government. It's not going to be addressed by state governments, although states may have their own patient protection of information laws and regulations as well, too. They're not going to dictate HIPAA, though. Again, that's in the federal realm jurisdiction for them to control. Same thing with licensure. Licensure whether you need a license, if you're going to provide services in another state, 
um, that is in their new state control. So you're really not going to see the feds dictating how that is going to like work. So there are a lot of commonalities on issues that you'll see them like address, but other things that are solely in the jurisdiction, either one um, government or the other. And right now, this for this particular section, we're going to focus on the federal level for the most part. And the federal um, level telehealth policy is really interesting. So before the pandemic, the feds, I would have ranked that Medicare policy, the federal policy for the most part, addressing telehealth as really behind a lot of states. A lot of states have made advancements over the years before COVID-19 hit. So they not necessarily didn't have anything that they needed to change in response to COVID-19, but they may not have had to make as many waivers as maybe the uh, feds had to do for programs such as Medicare. So there was a like significant change in response to COVID-19 as far as federal telehealth policy. Again, a lot of that is centered around Medicare, but there were other issues that also needed to be addressed as well. So we'll go into like what some of the recent developments have been and what sort of our post PHG landscape may look like. So right now we are still underneath the public health emergency. So a lot of what I'm saying is does not go into effect right now because we're underneath the public health emergency. It was actually just renewed last week. It was renewed on January 11th and we have it for another nine days. So that takes out to about April 11th of this year. There's been talk. Everybody was expecting this renewal to April and there's been talk, but not a whole lot so far of like, well, maybe there might be one more after April, but we know definitely, at least for now, that we have a public health emergency extended through April. Um, as I said, a lot of what I'm gonna be going over is talking about what happens after the PHE is declared over, whether that happens in April or at a later time, it is not what is going on right now, right this second, because we are still underneath the public health emergency. So keep that in mind. As I said, this can get a little confusing. So you gotta look at this as certain like different time levels of like where we are on things. So right now we're still underneath the public health emergency. A lot of those telehealth waivers are still around. And what I'm covering is really talking about more what's going to happen afterwards. So on the federal level, two approaches on like how to decide on like what changes to make and like how are you gonna make changes or how are you gonna address sort of the post PhD landscape? And you can do it through legislation, you can do it through administrative or regulatory action. So actually over the last couple of years, we've seen actions on both levels. So legislation is bills passing through Congress and being signed by the president and they become federal law. Administrative and regulatory, that's more of the administrating agency going through the regulatory process and deciding what the policy is going to be. And we've seen that a lot with um, CMS over the last couple of years, them taking steps or them doing actions that give us a clear idea of what the post PHE landscape for telehealth would look like in Medicare. So these are two ways that we've seen some developments and we're going to take legislation first. So legislation, three sort of major pieces of legislation that has happened during COVID-19 that addresses telehealth policy have been the Consolidated Appropriation Act of 2021, Budget Act of 2022, and the Consolidated Appropriation Act of 2023. So essentially, they have been like the budget bills for each year of the pandemic that we've been in. So the first year, the one for 2021 that took place in 2020, what it did was it didn't necessarily address any of the temporary telehealth policies that were created for COVID. What it did was, one of the things it did was create a permanent policy around mental and behavioral health. And what this policy said was, if you are trying to avoid the geographic requirement that is underneath the permanent telehealth Medicare policy and or the, the service is taking place while the patient is at home, and you don't already fall underneath some of the very narrow exceptions I already have for, for these services and these exceptions. And if you meet certain conditions, then we're not gonna apply the geographic requirement or the location requirement. So let me go over that again. So underneath permanent Medicare policy for telehealth, there are these requirements that the patient needs to be located in a certain type of geographic location, a rural location or non-metropolitan statistical area um, location, and non-HIPSA, HIPSA, um, and also that they need to be in a certain type of site, usually like some sort of medical facility. There are very narrow exceptions for the home, and one of them is a mental and behavioral health exception, but that has to be a you're being treated for a co-occurring mental health disorder when you are being treated for a substance use disorder. So very narrow. So what this particular policy said was 
You can be treated for any eligible mental and behavioral health service through telehealth and not have the geographic restriction apply. And you can also be in the home if certain conditions are met. And one of those conditions is that an in-person visit with a telehealth provider happens at least six months prior to when the telehealth services are taking place. So yes, they expanded it, but it required this condition. So if you have been hearing about, oh, well, we're going to be required to have a six-month in-person visit before we can provide mental health services, that's where this is stemming from for the most part. Keep in mind that some of this may have been picked up in other states as well too. But for the most part, that may be why you're thinking of like, oh, do we need the six months visit? It's this particular policy. Now, this policy, the requiring a six-month visit only is necessary. You only need to have that six-month visit if you're trying to avoid those location requirements. If you fall into, I kind of dubbed it original tele telehealth policy. It's not necessarily original, but like what existed before this past, like you were in an eligible geographic location, the patient was in an eligible geographic location and in an eligible site, then you don't need to have the in-person visit. So that was like the first step that the uh, that Congress took. Again, not really addressing like any of the COVID waivers, but it was the first sort of glimmer of like, okay, so we know that's going to be permanent policy after the PHG. The following year, there was the Budget Act of 2022. And what happened there was they created what I call a grace period for after the public health emergency. So now we have Congress saying like, this is what is going to happen once that PHG is declared over. And what they did was we're going to create a 151 day grace period. So about five months for certain telehealth waivers to remain in place. And these included like certain providers can continue to provide services via telehealth, the geographic limitations waive, the home can still be an eligible site, audio only can still be used for some services. They did not include all of the telehealth waivers that we saw implement in response to COVID-19. They only, they included some really big ones, but only some of them. So keep that in mind. It was only for a 151 day grace period. So that happened in 2021 going into 2022. Then we had December of 2022 and Congress passed basically another budget act. And in there, there was some um, language in there that basically said, the stuff that we created or said that would stick around for the 151 day grace period, we're extending that time. It's going to go out to December 31st, 2024. So we'll take a closer look at exactly what all those things are. And they added a couple of other things as well, too. So what is like going to be extended now to December 31st of 2024? First thing is that geographic requirement. It's going to remain suspended. So right now, underneath the pandemic, the PHE is that the geographic requirement for Medicare doesn't apply if, for, for telehealth. That's gonna stick around. We've got another essentially two years until the um, end of 2024. Home will continue to be allowed to be an eligible originating site, not only for like those narrow set of services I talked about earlier, but for like all eligible services. Allows for prov certain providers, certain providers, and I wanna emphasize that, to continue to be eligible providers to deliver services and get reimbursed by the Medicare program. So during the public health emergency, CMS said, all Medicare eligible providers who can provide the eligible services are eligible to do that via telehealth and get reimbursed. Congress did not say that. Congress created a specific list, a, and including like the permanent list of eligible providers that are in permanent telehealth policy, they said during this now grace period of two years, essentially until the end of 2024, PTs, o, um, OTs, audiologists, speech language pathologists can continue to be eligible providers. So if you're not on the permanent list or you're not one of these, these um, providers that were mentioned in the bill, it ends for you during during after the PHE is declared over. So keep that in mind as well. It also, what the legislation said, will also continue to allow FQHCs and RHCs to continue to provide services via telehealth. Now, on the perm FQHCs and RHCs are not on the permanent eligible provider list for um, telehealth delivered services underneath Medicare. They are... Um, they were made an exception for the public health emergency. There's been a lot of talk of adding them to permanent list, but they are technically right now is this time of time, this date, which is January 18th, um, 2023. That has not changed in the permanent policies. 
but they will continue to be allowed to provide services via telehealth and be reimbursed at least through 2024, be reimbursed by Medicare. So we're sticking to Medicare policy here. Also, audio only will continue to be allowed to be a modality to provide some services. And I say some services because not all the services on the eligible telehealth services list can be provided via an audio only. CMS has marked out very distinctly saying like, it's this service, is this service, it's not this service, it's not this service. So when you go and look at the list of eligible services, that's very clearly marked out on the list. So keep that in mind as well too. Now, what also it does, is I mentioned earlier with the Budget Act that was passed for um, 2021, they created that mental health exception in personal, in um, permanent policy where you have to have that in-person visit, they're saying like that's going to be delayed as well too. So that does not kick in until January 1st of 2025. Essentially, it's it's the delay for this process, for this period, this grace period now that ends at 2024. It is also requiring that, a, this is something you're requiring that a study on telehealth be made um, and that to look at data gathered from the services really essentially that we're done during this grace period. It's like from now until the end of this grace period, there's an interim report due to Congress October 1st of 2024, and then a final report of 2026. So they're really gonna be looking at the data during, during this little time where presumably, you know, the pandemic is being wound down or the public health emergency is being wound down and, and see that, which in some ways, if you think about it, it makes sense because you're at the beginning, you know, there was like this enormous spike because everybody was using telehealth. It's kind of leveled off now and like how many people are using services. So maybe they're thinking like, this is where we can get like more accurate data when there isn't like a spike that the initial start of the pandemic kind of, you know, did to telehealth. And then there's an extension of safe harbor for the deductible for, for telehealth as well. So that was something new too. That goes through, I, I'm sorry, I got a little bit cut off. I'll make sure to make an adjustment before uh, we make the slides public. But it, basically that was also extended through this grace period of the end of 2024. Now, the other way that I mentioned that there can be changes to policy and have them made permanent is through the administrative or regulatory process. And that's usually done through um, the physician fee schedule for CMS to Medicare. For those who aren't familiar with it, the physician fee schedules are a way of introducing new policies that are gonna take place and impact Medicare the following year. So for example, for stuff that takes um, starts on in 2023 this year, what CMS does is they release their proposals last summer in 2022, usually around July. There's like about 60 days for the public to provide comment. And then uh, CMS goes back, they write up a response to those comments and they publish their final proposals towards the end of the year, like around November, sometimes it's in early December. So they do that every year. That's not like anything unusual. And there's usually sometimes some stuff in telehealth in there. And over the last couple of years, there has been policies that would impact the permanent policies in um, Medicare going forward after need, after like APHG has been declared over. So what were they doing or what did they do, do over the last couple of years for, for policy that it takes place post PHG? Well, one of the things is services. Now, one thing I did not mention explicitly when I was talking about the Consolidated Appropriation Act or all those actions by Congress, I did not talk about the list of eligible services that can continue to be provided via telehealth. So when the pandemic happened, there is a permanent telehealth list of services that Medicare says that they'll reimburse if, use, if telehealth is used to provide that. When the pandemic happened, CMS added like about 100 125 like additional codes temporarily in response to the pandemic. So it brings up the list to about like, you know, 250, 260 total codes. So during this time from like when, from before the pandemic until like about now or last year, CMS has done a couple of things. They've made some of those temporary codes permanent. They put them on the permanent list there for uh, Medicare. So that means when the PHE is over, no matter what, those codes are on the permanent list, they're gonna stick around. There's not a lot of those. They didn't shift a lot over to the permanent list. It's been like maybe about 12 or 15 um, when you think about it that out of like 125, it's a small amount. There are some that they simply left on the temporary list. And that theoretically, once the public health emergency is over, will, since they haven't done anything with them, will like go away and not be eligible. 
they created a third category, what they call category three, which is a temporary holding bucket where they said some of those temporary COVID codes we're going to put in category three because we think they have some, some promise of maybe being moved over to the permanent list, but we don't have enough data and evidence on that yet. So we're going to keep them around for a period of time and gather more evidence and data and information to to help inform us on whether we should you know just let them sunset and not no longer be eligible or maybe move them over the permanent list and they have said that this period of time will be until the end of 2023 so so that's what they have come to as of like 2022 their last physician fee schedule what they have also said was you know what we're also going to make permanent policy that you can use audio only to provide mental and behavioral health services if certain conditions are met. Now, this is different than what Congress did. Congress was like trying to remove like geographic limitation, allow the home to be eligible originating site, then to talk about modality. They were talking about location, which, you know, they could have talked about modality if they wanted to, they, but they didn't really address it. And CMS has. Now, how was CMS able to do this if Congress didn't necessarily give them the power or didn't specify that they could do this? And the reason why is that in federal law, when you're talking about telehealth, when they're talking about modality, they just say telecommunication system. So it's like a broad term that's not defined anywhere in statute or what there was no sort of reference to a definition anywhere. So it is left to like the administrating agency, CMS, to decide how they're going to interpret that. And they have interpreted it now as saying like, it's going to include audio only, but only for mental and behavioral health services. And if certain conditions are met, and some of those conditions kind of mirror what Congress did with the expansion of telehealth or for telehealth to be used for mental and behavioral health services delivery without meeting like the geographic restriction and home being eligible or site, which is that six month in person visit. So I told you it would get complicated and it, it is, but know that once the PhD is over. Once all these grace periods are over, that's going to be a permanent policy that's sticking around and that audio only can be used in the Medicare program to provide mental and behavioral health services if certain conditions are met. Now, they redefine mental health visits for FQHCs and RHCs too. So I mentioned earlier that FQHCs and RHCs are not on that permanent telehealth provider list for Medicare. That's actually something in statute. So that does require Congress to change. It's not something that CMS can do. So you're going to ask me, like, well, how can how can they do this now, allowing FQHCs and RHCs to use live video and audio only to deliver mental and behavioral health services? The reason they were able to do that is because they redefined what a mental health visit meant to include that it also means that they can use live video and audio only to deliver these services. So CMS redefined a term that allowed the use of telehealth, of telehealth, at least live video and audio only, those modalities to provide that service. So for FQHCs and RHCs, that doesn't mean they become telehealth providers. They're simply still providing their mental health visits, but they have these other channels of doing it as well too. And also there are special billing instructions um, post of like how to do this as well too. Now, all that to say that for those last two bullets about the permanent audio only policy and the redefinition of mental health FQHCs. And also also for the FQHCs, they do have to meet certain conditions as well to like utilize audio only. Um, right now, CMS has said, well, we're going to delay implementation of those policies for the 151 day grace period post PHG. Now, you may be asking like, I just, you know, May just got through talking about a two year grace period until the end of 2024. What's this 151 day grace period? I thought that was wiped out. It was wiped out by Congress. They extended it to the end of 2024. But remember, this is administrative action that CMS needs to take. And CMS did this back in 2022. So back in 22 for the physician fee schedule, they were aligning their policies to what they knew was existing existing law at the time. And that was the 22 Budget Act. The 2023 Budget Act took place just before Christmas in December of last year. So it's only a couple of weeks out. And at this point, CMS has not quite aligned their policies yet with like the congressional developments that have happened already. So that's why you'll still see like, 
Well, some of the stuff is going to be a one, there's still a 151 day grace period, the, some of the policies. That's because it's the CMS policy decisions and they just haven't had time to align them. And they may not, need, they don't need to align them like today. Um, I mean, it'd be nice if they did, but remember, going back, we're still in a public health emergency. So none of this stuff applies yet because we're still underneath the public health emergency. So we're at these different levels here. It's like we had Congress Act, CMS is, has their current policies, have are operating on what they knew in 2022 because they haven't had time to align themselves with Congress. But these actions right now, today, don't go into effect because we're still underneath the public health emergency. <laughs> so as I said, a lot of, I was talking to somebody, it's like, it's kind of like Jenga. You're just trying to move these pieces together and, and you know, and hoping they, they they don't collapse on you. But but yes, so Congress did some action. It's only a few weeks old. CMS still has not caught up with it as far as we know. I mean, my assumption is, is they're going to align policies, but they just haven't yet. It's only been a few weeks. But also there's, there's still the fact that we're underneath the public health emergency, so they have time to do that as well, too. So here's an overview, and I want to just also be clear, this is an overview of a lot of what I was talking about, but it is not everything, because I think there was like 60 or 70 different federal policies that impacted telehealth. Maybe there was more. And in response to COVID at the very beginning, I'm, I can't remember the exact number, but this, this does not include all of them. This includes a lot of what I just talked about and a couple other things that I'll go over. So you have here, first column is the permanent telehealth policy. So this is what we know as of today, again, January 18th, 2023, what we know the world would look like once we're post PhD and there's no more grace periods and all these other policies like, you know, have, have expired, what we, what will we be left with this, what would be permanent. And it's like still the geographic restriction with some limited exceptions, um, still like a limited list of providers. Uh, we are allowed to like do mental health in the home without the geographic restriction. If certain conditions are met, that type of thing. Um, I'm going to skip the second column. We'll come back to it. But the third column, post PhD through December 31st, 2024, that this is like all of the recent actions in that congressional bill and that budget bill. And then I have at the bottom, the asterisk of like the list of eligible services are still underneath that 151 day grace period. Because again, that was a decision left to CMS to make underneath the physician fee schedule. And right now they are still aligned with like the previous bill that had the 151 day grace period. So again, it's my assumption that CMS will, will eventually align to what was in the last budget act. But right now the policy says it's up, it's aligning with the 151 day grace period. Post PhD, what goes away immediately after the end of 2023? That is the category three services. Excuse me. That's the category three services, that temporary holding bucket. We know that that's going to stick around till, till um, the end of 2023. Again, I don't know if like CMS will decide to like align that again with um, what Congress did and maybe have the date be to 2024. They have changed it in the past. They've like changed when that's going to happen. Um, so we'll see what happens with that. But right now, again, the current policy is until the end of 2023. Also, what I have not touched upon is virtual presence for direct supervision, where you allow telehealth is allowed to be used. That that was an exception that was done for the pandemic. Again, the current policy is that CMS said that's going to last through the end of 2023. So I'm not sure if they're going to change that again. Automatically goes away. This goes away automatically. No grace period. It goes away when the PHG is declared over. And that is among some of those things is OCR exercising discretion on HIPAA. For those who may not be familiar at the beginning of the pandemic, Office of Civil Rights, OCR, which oversees HIPAA came out with a guidance that said, we're gonna exercise discretion as people try to stand up these telehealth programs on what platform you use. Because we know you guys are trying to do this really quickly. This is an emergency. So we're we're not going to look too closely if maybe you're not using like a HIPAA compliant platform. OCR has said that goes away immediately once the PhD is declared over. So 
we're going into three years in the pandemic. I'm helping people like, you know, if they did that in the beginning because they were trying to stand up programs, telehealth programs that in the subsequent time that has passed that they've, they've like gotten it up to, to standard there. Um, but if you haven't, keep, keep in mind that that ends once the PHE is over, no grace period. The other major exception is prescribing a controlled substance now, and this is over in the permanent policy as well, too. Now, the prescribing of controlled substance when you can use telehealth without far, falling into one of the previously existing narrow exceptions or having an in-person visit with the patient, between the patient and the telehealth provider, that exception kicked in automatically once the PHE was declared over. And it was a previously existing exception. It was something already in federal law. Congress, CMA, uh, DEA, nobody created that in response to COVID-19. It already existed. So there has been a lot of talk on like, well, can this be extended? There hasn't, I haven't seen anything permanent come out from either DEA, like as far as regulations or like Congress um, releasing like, um, uh, a, a indication from Congress that maybe it might be included in something. Um, it wasn't included in the last budget bill. So that is something that technically right now, as of today, would disappear once the PHG is declared over. No grace period for that either. There are, like I said, a lot of other things, but these were some of the things, like some of the major things that I wanted to pull out for you as well. So keep that in mind. If they were not talked about over the last year or so, like included in some of these bills or CMS did not like even bring them up in like the physician fee schedule, my guess would be they're probably going away right after the PHE is declared over because I haven't seen anybody talking about that. And these are some of the things that, you know, people hadn't been talking about that might just automatically go away. So, so keep that in mind. If there's been no talk about extending it, it wasn't included in any of the congressional bills and CMS hasn't really like brought it up in like their physician receipt schedule. And it was a temporary COVID response policy. It's probably gonna be gone once the PHE is declared over. Other federal actions. So something to be aware of is like there's been, there are other, the other agencies that do things that are um, related or impact telehealth as well too. So these things to keep in mind. There is a proposed regulations that SAMHSA introduced where they were want to make permanent initiation of buprenorphine via audio only or audio or live video, audio visual telehealth, it's essentially live video. If, it's very narrow though, if it's an opiate treatment program, physician or authorized healthcare professional. So it's very narrow, but it does, you know, address a bit of that controlled substance area as well too. Um, so that's a proposed regulation by SAMHSA. Additionally, one other thing that really impacts the states more is that CMS issued a letter noting that Medicaid programs can cover e-consult or interprofessional consultations, but it's not mandated. So for those who may not be familiar, over the last couple of years, Medicaid programs have been asking the feds, it's like, is this something that we can do underneath Medicaid reimburse for e-consult? And there's been a little bit of conflicting information. Just earlier this year, I think January 5th or 6th, a letter was issued by CMS saying like, yes, Medicaid programs, you can do that. You may need to submit a state plan amendment. We're not mandating it. It's a decision left up to you. There were one or two questions I had about that that weren't clear to me, and I've sent in an inquiry to CMS, so I haven't gotten a response yet. Um, when, when we do, you know, CCHP will release that information of like what response we may have gotten, but that is something that's out there as well, too. So a lot of stuff, kind of confusing maybe, but there, there you have it. Those are like the current federal actions here. We're only in mid-January, who knows what might happen over the next coming months, but that's kind of where we are right now. This is our website. We do track not only the federal stuff, but the state stuff as well. And the states are all at different places too. So if you're interested in particular state or states, I suggest you go to the policy finder and take a look at that. We also have our newsletter as well too, um, but I think that is it. This is the contact information for CCHP. And I'm going to pause there to let folks type in their question. I see there are a couple of them there, but if you could just give me one second. Okay, sorry. I just had to go off screen there for one second. Let me take a look at the first question here. Okay. Um, 
Okay, are there, I think it means, are there rules only apply to providers, organizations, clinics that accept Medicaid patients or all providers practicing telehealth? I'm not exactly certain what they're referring to. So what I covered today was talking about Medicare. Aside from that e-consult item that I mentioned at the end, everything was about Medicare. So it wasn't about Medicaid, nor was it about commercial payers. So if you were not here for the beginning of this talk, and I talked about state and federal, um, states for the most part control what commercial payers do. So if you're talking about private payers, so that's that's not something the, the feds necessarily control for a lot of their telehealth policy. But what does happen is like sometimes there's replication of what happens with Medicare and their policies. But today, for the most part, again, aside from like that little bit at the end there when I was talking about econsul, I've been talking about Medicare policy. Um, Post PHE, will CMS continue allowing telehealth providers to build non facility rates prior to COVID pandemic? This was not allowed during tourisming site restriction. I've not seen anything about that. Keep in mind, we are still rating, um, waiting for some instructions for some of these policies from CMS, but I have not seen anything about continuing like those rates so far. So there may be like a lot of questions where I say, well, we're going to have to wait for us to see what CMS comes out with um, because we might just have to. How will Medicare provider enrollment change for telehealth providers post PHE? I don't think there is really any difference if you are a telehealth provider as far as the enrollment, as far as like what you need to do. They, they do say, um, that you need to follow like the state laws and regulations. If, if you're a provider and you are treating patients in another state, they say you do need to follow the state laws and regulations there. So, so there's that, but I don't think there's any like difference as far as like getting enrolled as a Medicare provider if you're a telehealth provider. Do you anticipate that video calls will not be covered for mental behavioral health in the future? Uh, no, that's actually one area where I think, or one specialty that I think will actually be pretty safe. If you're talking about Medicare, um, keep in mind this entire this entire uh, presentation has really focused in on Medicare. Now, what your Medicaid program might be doing, or what a commercial payer might be doing, um, will could differ. But I would say that mental behavioral health is like one of those the specialties that there's usually, you know, more policy addressing it and covering it, especially if you're talking about live video, um, you may have like a different, different policies if you're trying to do it via audio only, but um, mental behavioral health seems to be one of the, seems to be the area that I think policymakers feel most comfortable with when technology is being used to provide that. Okay. Bill, first PF, P, 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 that slide should note it is for 2022 physician fee schedule. Thank you, Bill. Um, I understand that this webinar focused on federal currency. Do you expect the same rules will be in place for private insurance? That's going to depend on the state and what they may require of them. So it's going to vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Uh, thank you for the wonderful information and detail. I'm curious if there's going to be separate rulemaking from CMS on the December 2024 grace period. So this is this is one thing that I'm not quite sure of like what might happen as far as timing. Um, as I said, there is no need for CMS to do something today. And we're in Jan we're again, sorry to keep repeating the date, but people might watch the recording. That's why I keep repeating the date. So we're on January 18th. 2023. There's nothing really prompting CMS to, to do, do something today on January 18, 2023, release something today, because we are still underneath the public health emergency. So, and this is where the timing gets a little, I'm not quite sure what will happen here. You know, CMS could always issue like an emergency regulation, you know, before then. So they align up if the public health emergency ends at 2020, April 2023, because if they don't and they wait for their usual physician fee schedule, schedule, which the proposal doesn't even come out until usually around July of the year, and then the final comes out at the end of the year, and then it goes into effect at the beginning of the year. Although I guess they could always put it like goes into effect immediately once it's final, once it's published. But um, so that timing is off then 
if the public health emergency only lasts until April 2023, there's going to be like a couple of months gap. So I don't know if they will actually, if they decide to align it. Now, there's there's also that as well, too. I, I'm assuming they're going to align it just because they've done it in the past. But if they decide to align it, I'm not sure it's going to work if we only have a public health emergency lasting to April and they wait until the regular physician fee schedule process. So if they think like definitely there's not going to be another renewal, then um, they would, I would guess they would have to do some sort of emergency regulation or something like that uh, in order to like meet the timing of it for the end of the public health emergency. So that is something that we're keeping our eye on of like what they may do, definitely just what they may do, but also like the timing of it. Um, and you know, you know, they they are more in the know than I am. So maybe they do know something about like there's going to be another extension after April too, which again doesn't quite really align things up. But you know, I'm I'm not sure. So those are like the options that I can think of for for that. Okay. Um, Hey, during the 151 day grace period, is it only the category three telehealth services that were in place or all temporary eligible telehealth services? It is all temporary telehealth services. So, so what CMS did through their physician fee schedules, they said like the eligible telehealth services list, we're going to align with what Congress did and they're going to stick around for the 151 day grace, day grace period. It's like the, in, the entire, the entire list. Um, again, that was when they thought there was just going to be 151 day grace period. So, so it's not just category three. Category three is almost kind of like this whole sort of separate thing in some ways, even though it's like the same, some of the same codes, but no, for, for grace period, grace period uh, reasons, it's the entire list. So that is what they said. Is there a requirement for the provider to keep medical records in the telehealth consultation and eventually provide to patient or other doctor specified in the legislation? Not in the legislation. Um, again, if you're talking about the, the bills that I went over, that was not specified in the legislation. If you're talking about, if you're, if you if you are talking about like Medicaid, there may be some, depending on your state. So depending on your state, there may be some requirements of you um, do that and the payer. There is some requirement of you noting in the record. I mean, the thing is when, when things take place via telehealth, you're supposed to record it in the medical record like you would any other service as well too. So, but eventually providing it to the patient or other doc, uh, doctor specified, again, it, it, any obligation you have of like keeping information of like a service you provided to a patient, regardless of whether you did it via telehealth or in person, I mean, I'm, just because you did telehealth, it does not exempt you from like also recording that information. And I'm not saying like you need to like record the video visit or anything. I'm saying like, you know, the information that you take in for the medical record you're not exempted from doing that still when you're using telehealth. But if your question was, did they specify that in a piece of legislation, the legislation that went over? No, they did not go over that. But you are required to take down certain information, put it in the patient record. You may have obligations of like providing the information, the patient record information to the patient when they ask for it. Those don't go away if you're using telehealth. So keep that in mind as well too. Um, let's see. For PTOTST and private practice providing Part B services, are there specific documentation requirements that must be included within the therapy notes for Medicare to cover the services? For example, do they need to document that they are providing telehealth versus in-person visits to reduce the risk of exposure of COVID-19? Are there eligibility requirements for circumstances that patients must fall under for Medicare to cover telehealth? So CMS does have like guidances on how to bill the information. Um, I don't believe that they have a requirement that you, the reason you did use telehealth was because of quote COVID-19. 
But again, like as a previous question, it's like the documentation that you you normally do, regardless of whether you're using telehealth or in-person services, that still applies. Um, for telehealth specific, there are certain like billing things you need to do if you're using a certain modality, um, such as like a, a code to, to signify that you may have done certain modalities, but CMS has like, you know, guidance on like, you know, how you're supposed to bill as well too. Do we know what telehealth platforms are HIPAA compliant? I would suggest that you um, engage with the Technology Resource Center. So the, the consortium is made up of 14 telehealth resource centers and we're all funded by the federal government. And as Aria mentioned at the beginning of this, CCHP is a policy one, but there's also a technology one. It's called um, Telehealth Technology Assistance Center, TTAC. Um, if they're based out of Alaska, I would suggest contacting them to get more guidance on that. To clarify, after PHE, the requirements for in-person visits since prior to telehealth services back in place for controlled substances. So once the PHE is over, if you want to use telehealth, you would need to either fall into one of the other existing exceptions where telehealth can be used. These exceptions include things such as the patients in a DEA registered facility at the time of the telehealth interaction or they're with a DEA, DEA registered provider at the time of the telehealth interaction in order for the provider to provide services via telehealth or prescribe controlled substances um, without having an in-person visit, or you can have an in-person visit with the telehealth provider. I think you're, you're mixing up the six months prior a bit with like the mental health visit, but if we're talking about controlled substances, there are certain exceptions that um, you don't need to have that six month in-person visit and you could just use telehealth, but they're very narrow. And it basically requires the, the patient either being with a specific type of person or in a specific type of facility, usually something that's like DEA registered. So, so that's what happens on that controlled substance prescribing issue immediately following the public health emergency. Does existing federal policy in telehealth not relate with mental behavioral health services? So Sylvia Martin, I, I'm not quite sure I understand your question. If you could clarify that, I'll circle back around to it if we, we've got time here. So during the PHE, CMS allow facility-based providers to bill at a higher non-facility professional rate since telehealth service cannot be a facility. Can you say anything about what happens with this after PHE ends? I have not heard anything about extending that. So as I said earlier, if we hadn't heard anything about it or it hasn't shown up in the physician fee schedule to be addressed over the last couple of years, I'm kind of thinking it's most likely one of, go, one of those things that's going to disappear immediately after the public health emergency is declared over. I don't know for certain, but I, I just have not seen it addressed anywhere. Um, if somebody knows differently, then you know, please let the rest of us know. But I it wasn't in the it wasn't in any of the commercial bills and it wasn't in any of the physician fee schedules up to this point being addressed. So it's possible, it, it, it's likely it's going to just disappear immediately. Any update on DA's drafting proposed rules for implementing special telemedicine registration program under Brian Haydack? Not that I know of. I know a lot of people have been asking about this. I know there's a lot of concern about like, you know, what happens once the PHE is declared over and the, um, that's like one thing that automatically goes away. I know, I believe it was Senator Mark Warner from Virginia asked DEA about this in 2021, saying, where's the registry? The registry. So for those who aren't familiar with it, the one of the other exceptions, narrow exceptions, um, beyond what I talked about uh, earlier about con prescribing controlled substance, I said like, oh, you need, basically need to be in the DEA registered facility or like a DA licensed provider at the time of the telehealth interaction and a couple of narrow exceptions. One of the other narrow exceptions is you're on this registry that the DA created, which theoretically the, the idea is if you're a telehealth provider, you get on the registry, you're a good actor, they're not going to worry about you, you can go ahead and prescribe and not have to fall into one of those other narrow exceptions or have a PHE existing. Only problem is DA hasn't created the registry and they were ordered by Congress to finalize regulations at the end of 2019. They didn't, and then COVID hit, and people got 
you know, caught up with COVID and we're concerned about other things. But now that, you know, it looks like the PhD is coming over, people are asking like, well, where's the registry? So that's where that question is coming from. I have not seen anything from DEA regarding it publicly. I mean, I don't know. They could be doing internal actions and like trying to work this out. But so far, I have not seen anything made public yet. Are there any specific exception for Ryan White programs? Sometimes there are patients these programs have outside the states and country, wondering if this has been addressed specifically as it pertains to location. Not where Medicare is concerned. Um, if you're, again, a lot of this focus has been on Medicare. So I, I have not seen anything specific to the Ryan Hate program, not Ryan Hate, Ryan White app, Ryan White programs um, as far as. Um, telehealth and and also keep in mind though so if your your question because you mentioned like outside the states and country talking about maybe licensure if they are talking about like cross state issues that's a licensure issue and it's a it's a state thing and also outside of the country when you're talking international it gets a little tricky there because as far as medicare is concerned like they can't reimburse if the providers out of the country uh, providing the services or the patients like traveling as well too, they're very like, it's gotta be in the, the United States or the territory. Um, so, so I'm not, there hasn't been any mention in like the Medicare programs or Medicare pro policies around why, Ryan White, but I'm not also not certain if like your question relates more to maybe something that might be like a state issue such as life insurance as well too. Um, does Medicare reimburse for e-visits in 2023? Um, they do for some codes. I don't know if there's a specific code that you're looking for. You can always go to the CMS website and see like what their specific codes are that they're reimbursing for, but they do reverse, reimburse for some. Are there any new regulations regarding patients seen through telehealth programs who are referred to 911, special and documentation? Uh, not that I'm aware of. There may be something in your states. I don't think we've come across anything, though, related to 911 calls, though. There have been some policies around um, emergency rooms or um, emergency holds when somebody is experiencing like a mental, extreme mental health conditions. But as far as like 911 visits and like special documentations, I and nothing is coming to mind. Is there a comprehensive list of payers that pay for telehealth services? I wish there was. Uh, so this, again, no, there, that does not exist. Uh, Part of the reason is that it, states have various rules and regulations for commercial plans. So it's going to vary from state to state on what they're required to do. Um, some plans are, health plans are very like open about what their telehealth policies are. And some are a little bit more, more um, reticent or private about like what their policies are. But there's no comprehensive list. CCHP has tried in the past to, to like gather that. Um, it would take a lot of resources to like do that research and it probably still would not be complete, I would say, um, only because again, I think some plans are a little bit more um, protective of like that information. They may not make that publicly available. I've been hearing a lot of concerns about the use of G2025 for FQHCs and the lack of information making its way to CMS, for example, AWV being completed. Curious your thoughts on telehealth being continued through to December 2024. Feel free to skip this. It's not the most appropriate for the presentation. Um, so there's also presumably, there's all, whenever new policies come out, there's presumably going to be instructions from the administrating agency. So a lot of these things may be, again, as I said earlier, that we may need to wait to see what CMS does as well or what guidance they may issue. So it's one of those wait and see. Uh, CCHP, we do not have an inside track on like, you know, anything that's in draft form that a government agency is doing. So, you know, in, in some ways, when they re release it publicly, we know about it as soon as you do. I mean, I may get a hint and then somebody may say to me, it's like, oh, they're working on something, but I won't know any details or anything like that. So in a lot of ways, CCHP is in the same boat as everybody else in that we just need to wait and see. <laughs> 
And sometimes it's just guesswork on our part as well, too. And I make that very clear whenever I'm guessing about things, such as saying like the timing for what CMS, CMS might do regarding of like aligning with the recent legislation as well, too. So, so it's, I mean, I'm sorry, I can't give you like more definitive answer here, but sometimes it's just sort of a wait and see of what the, the regulatory agency or the ministering agency does. Uh, would a beach provider be able to refill an R? Uh, okay, so would a behavioral health provider be able to refill a prescription of a controlled substance? So I would need more details on what situation you're talking about. Do they already, or is this like the refilling for a currently existing patient or, or what is the situation? Are you doing it for like somebody else? Like this is like a new patient to them. I would need to know a little bit more information to answer that. Oh, <laughs> I'm, I'm not gonna read it, but Mary Beth Walker, thank you for the, the compliment. <laughs> Uh, do you think CMS will extend the Category 3 codes to December 2024? They might. I mean, like I said in my presentation, like Category 3 deadline, they have been changed that with like subsequent physician fee schedule um, updates. So so they might as well. Uh, and they might like, you know, again, they might just go for that realignment. So everything ends at 2024 and there's no confusion. But, but right now I have to say like it ends in 2023 just simply because that is what they policy is. Do you have any thoughts on hospital-employed physical therapists providing telehealth services? This was originally under hospital without walls, but the FAQ seems to go back and forth from calling this telehealth. Wonder if this will continue post-PhD under therapy allowed to continue for a grace period, or, or if this is under a waiver and will be with the PhD. I have not seen that be, uh, that's one of those where I haven't seen that being addressed, that they're going to continue to allow that. So I'm not saying that they won't continue to allow it. I'm just saying I have not seen anything addressing it so far. And that kind of makes me a little less hopeful of it continuing once the PHE is over. So um, is there any language that expands the use of telehealth for palliative or hospice care, both in the home or inpatient? Not that I've seen so far. And I, again, when I say something like that, I am thinking strictly about what's going on on the federal level here. What may be happening on the state level may be different, depending on the state that you're in. I think it's, what are some steps that health centers that predominantly serve Medicaid enrollees, not Medicare, can take to prepare for the end of the PhD? First off, figure out what your states are doing. And as I said, states are in different places. There are some states where they have already established what their program policy is. So you know, no surprises unless they decide to go and change it later. But some of them have already established permanent policy. So the first step is really to look at what your states are doing because they're all in different places. Figure out like what they will allow if you're dealing with primarily Medicaid population. And some states can be like very different. So I'm from California and California has a pretty expensive policy that they settle upon for um, their permanent policy, but then you can go to another state that has a much narrow policy on what they're doing. Like maybe they will only do like a couple services. Maybe there's no audio only and everything. Maybe they don't even allow FQHCs to be a telehealth provider. That's coming less common. I mean, since the pandemic, that's becoming a little bit more common or more explicit here. We do have a um, FQHC section just for Medicaid policies. Um, on our CCHP website. So you don't even have to wait through like the, the main portion of the state section. You can just go to like the FQHC button down there and like pull it up and like read that information. But it's gonna depend on what state you're in and they do vary widely. Um, are we still waiting on future info on CMS will enact POS 10 as well? My understanding was that this was for the permanent mental behavioral health services, which would become permanent after PHG. Curious, is there more intel on the new year extension? So my guess is they're not going to be in a rush to talk about that permanent mental health policy, the one that requires the in-person visit, if you're trying to avoid a geographic restriction, that thing, um, mainly because now we do know we have the two-year grace period. So, so that I think there's going to be like kind of a, definitely kind of like CMS is just going to take their time with that because they don't have until the end of the PhD. They actually technically now have until the end 
of um, 2024 because of what Congress did. So I don't think that they will, which it may actually be a good thing because it gives them time to really think about it so they can figure, figure out like how best to like write that up for folks so it's very clear to them. What is the purpose of the one in-person visit for behavioral health appointments? That was a surprise to me when I saw that in the bill two years, two years, two years ago, um, two years, years ish. It, it was a surprise to me. I, I don't know how they settled in on that, that it has to take place six months before um, or where they pulled that from. As far as I knew, that was not even like really being discussed widely. And then I was like surprised that that was in there. So I don't know. I'm not I'm not quite sure where it is. I, I'm sure people, I'm not a practitioner though. And maybe there's like some, some clinical reason for it. So I'm not probably not the best person in that, but I don't know where that came from, to be honest. For private pay telehealth mental health practice, do we go on state policies for the end of the pandemic or federal regulations when with it ending state emergency in 2024? Depends. So it depends on, so for the most part, it's going to be state because when you're talking about private pay, commercial payers, that for the most part is controlled by the state. So for the most part, it's going to go for, for the state. And I said, it depends. The only reason I say that is because um, some states may have their temporary telehealth policies tied to what happens on the federal level, primarily like with the of the P. Um, so, so it depends on that, but you're really going to depend on what happens on the state and, uh, excuse me, what the state says, as opposed to what the Fed said when you're talking about private payer. I hope Medicare is going to continue the audio only visits because our, uh, yeah. So that is one reason for audio only to continue to be used because, um, you know, of, of the difficulty that patients may have for whatever reason in like utilizing audio only. So we we shall see what happens after the grace period. And that grace period does give Congress two years to like figure out something and like if they want to make anything permanent. Um, what days do you think CMS would like more at this point to advance telehealth for providers? So if you, obviously outcomes, everybody talks about outcomes. Um, the, the, kind of like hard part of that is like, well, how do you measure that? And I, I I did a presentation right before this one for another group and they asked a similar question. And I said, part of the problem has been like the data that's being collected right now, I think from like Medicare and like Medicaid programs may not be the best data to draw from to, to figure out outcomes. But that's always at the forefront of policymakers' mind is like, is this as good? as in person or like what were the health outcomes so they always do want to see you know outcomes i would also say you know like who is using it like the demographics of the type of patient as well too i think they're very curious about that also um it was a little bit broad as far as like what was in the bill regarding those reports to congress that have to be done regarding the data there but some of the things that they did cite was like utilization and also what type of specialties it was being used for those types of pieces of information as well too is we're actually out of time i'm going to answer a couple how many more questions are there? I'm going to try to answer a couple more questions, but we're a little bit over. So I'm just going to stay on for like, let's say another like three or four minutes here to try to answer as many questions. Um, okay, so what is the best way to keep posted on policy changes and being able to, for being able to reimburse? You can follow the CCHP website and our newsletter. We try to keep people updated that way. So definitely that's one way of doing that. Also keep in contact with your telehealth resource centers. So there are 12 regional telehealth resource centers as well. They're great about information as well too, especially like things, changes going on at the state level. So you might wanna like also engage with them as well. Um, what payment, C payment, okay, so where should we look to know about the DEA? You, again, CC, you can follow CCHP regarding that as well, too. Uh, we're keeping an eye on it. Some of these are like follow-up to other questions. I'm going to try to like find people that I maybe have not seen or respond to. 
Are you familiar with what exactly is the uniform telehealth drafted by the Uniform Law Commission? It's basically model legislation. So for those who are not familiar, there's this uh, commission of lawyers who have draw, drafted state model legislation around telehealth. So that's what this person is referring to. Um, it's not it's not legislation. It's model legislation. So they put it forward for for and see if like anybody takes up. So it's not an actual piece of legislation. It's model legislation at this point. Post PhD, if you're seen in a patient person, and then conduct. Oh, okay. Do any of these policies regarding telehealth affect remote monitoring services? Um, again, with the, the Medicare stuff, the so a lot of the the waiver. Okay, so so with Medicare. And again, this presentation, this is going to be the last question. So the with Medicare, um, a lot of the COVID waivers didn't really address uh, remote patient monitoring. There was some, but also you have to keep in mind, um, um, Medicare and CMS treats remote patient monitoring as something else. It falls underneath like kind of a different category they have called communications-based technology service, CBTS. And it's not necessarily underneath their telehealth policy umbrella. So, so these things that I've been talking about address the telehealth policy. Now, this is a whole other talk of like the two different categories of services that CMS views things through. They view stuff that's like telehealth, that's all, a lot of that policy is in federal law. And then they have this whole other category, which e-visit also falls under CTBS. And also some of the remote patient monitoring stuff falls under as well too. So that's treated differently. Um, and that also doesn't really require Congress to act as something that they can do administratively. But the stuff that I talked about do doesn't necessarily address that as well. We, we've, we focused on telehealth. I don't mean to be cryptic about this, but if you've, if you've like maybe go to our website, I have recorded some videos on like the differences on this as well, but just really briefly, CMS has kind of like two different categories of technology delivered services. One is called telehealth, which a lot of that policy is embedded in federal law. Um, and then there's communications technology-based services that uses telehealth technology, but CMS doesn't regard it as telehealth. And their distinction is like those services are not a one-on-one -on -one replacement for something that can happen in person. So they view telehealth as like, it's a replacement for in-person services. CTBS is something that typically doesn't happen in person, but technology allows them to, to providers to provide this now and they wanna reimburse for some of those services. So in answer to this question, no, those policies that I went over don't necessarily impact the Medicare policies on remote patient monitoring, but also keep in mind, where CMS is concerned, they kind of have it in a different category to begin with. And that is it. My apologies for going over. Aria, thank you for sticking around. He's going to talk about filling out the survey. It really helps if you fill out the survey. So please remember to do that. Thank you, May. I'm just going to bring up the closing slide. Oh, let me stop share. Okay. Um, so just a reminder that our next webinar will be held on Thursday, February 16th, and that will be hosted by the Mid-Atlantic Telehealth Resource Center, focusing on telehealth to advance the care of patients in uh, congregate care settings. Registration information is up on the NCTRC events page. Uh, and then lastly, we do ask that you take a few short minutes to complete that survey that will pop up at the conclusion of this webinar. Your feedback is very valuable to us. Uh, thank you again to May and to the Center for Connected Health Policy for hosting today's webinar. And have a great day, everyone.